Okay, so let's start. Please sit down. Um, <clears throat> a few uh, remarks. Is this easier to see than white or not? No? Okay, so I'll change that. You should let me know what's easiest to see, okay? So I increased the font size uh, colors here. So you rather have the text in black and uh, this apply. Is it? Is this easier? Yeah. Okay, very good. You see? Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that what is needed for the... Uh, I'll like this okay very good so uh, please sit down we're gonna start there's six people in this class that did not pass mathematics 3d or math 3d okay I have their names I have their student numbers I can either contact you or you better come up to me because you cannot enroll in this class unless I give approval. So this is a matter of utmost priority, okay? So you need to come here, you need to get a piece of paper so that I can give you approval to enroll in this class because formally you're not allowed to. If you don't do it before the middle of next week means that unfortunately you can no longer be in this class, okay? Because this was a prerequisite, okay. Then there was another uh, remark about the ASCE meeting Wednesday till Friday, yes. Um, the students are responsible for taking, I got a general email from uh, one person that I don't know who that person is, it was just uh, a general email with like 55 students that were going to that meeting. You cannot expect me even though I take a lot of responsibility, but you cannot expect me to look at all those 55 students, look which, uh, look which session, the session they're enrolled, then provide an alternative for each 55 because that's going to take hours and hours of work. Students that did not attend the lab session on Wednesday, Thursday or Friday because they went to that uh, meeting, which is fine, they're responsible for contacting us so that we can find an alternative. And again, this, is also, this also has priority because next week is the first quiz. Okay, so take own initiative. You cannot expect us to resolve these problems for you. Okay, we're at the university, we're no longer at the high school, okay? I'm already trying to hand a lot to you on a golden platter, like to, by, by giving you all these scripts, but I can only go so far. You cannot expect me to send a list with like, uh, like 90 students and I figure out where I place what student and figure out whether they actually attended the lab session or not. So it's student's responsibility. So that wasn't a very nice start, I know. But so you know, okay? Okay, so next week is the first quiz. Consists of about 15 questions multiple choice so uh, we'll know the outcome immediately but I will not let you know the outcome until Friday because otherwise it's not fair to the Monday group if I show the results on Monday already because then students know how well they did and they can take advantage of that etc but anyway so the questions are going to be different for the different sessions okay so I'm trying to do as fair as possible and for those that complain about the fact that we don't have one quiz with 200 students, it is very simple, we just don't have a room available of that size. So this is a complaint that I'm getting every year, this is a request I make to campus every year 57 times, but I just don't have that available. So that's why we have five lab sessions. For us, it would be way more efficient to have one lab session. Way more economical, <clears throat> way better. But unfortunately, that is not possible. So that's why we have five quizzes for each of the five different lab sessions. And we have five different lab sessions. 
So please keep that in mind. If you want to complain about something, keep in mind that there's nothing we can do about this. And it's the same with the scheduling of the Monday session prior to the first lecture. This is going to be resolved in two weeks. Because then we're going to discuss material that lacks a week. Okay, if you, uh, you can see that in the syllabus. So again, there's little we can do about it. So we need to move on a little faster uh, uh, today because we still have quite some material and I'm going to go over it again. So let's look here at line number eight. I define here a vertical vector. It appears a horizontal vector, but what you see is at the end you see prime symbol, which means transpose that column with numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4. That statement on line 8 is similar to the statement on line 11 where I use the semicolon. The semicolon means either suppress output writing when you put it at the end of the line or in this case it means go to the next line. So first you have a 1 and then go to the next line, then put a 2 on the next line, then go to the next line, then put a 3, and so forth. So these statements are the same. And depending on your preference, you can select, you can select whichever you like, okay? Now, again, semicolon here suppresses output writing to the screen. And in many cases, we have long scripts. We don't like everything to be written to the screen because we get way too much information. So we use a semicolon. Now, imagine that I like to remove a certain number. This is my A now, yeah? And I don't like the second element of A. So what I do, and we went over this last time, round brackets, A, second number, and I just define that it's now empty and this is my new A. So what has happened is that MATLAB based on this statement that I just gave, I said MATLAB please remove the second scalar of my vector. Replace it with an empty cell and MATLAB automatically reorganizes the vector and now it's a vector of three by one, three rows, one column. Okay, so if I ask for the size of A, you see that it's three by one now. Three rows, one column. Everything you do in MATLAB with indices in a vector in a matrix, it's always row, uh, comma, column. Okay, so three rows, one column. Rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. Okay, okay. Now, let's now define a matrix, okay? Now I have a matrix here, what I defined here, yeah? And now I have three elements on each row. And I have four different uh, rows. So I have four rows, three columns. That's the size, and we can check that if that's true. And that's four by three, indeed. Now, let's now, maybe we like to print not the entire matrix, but maybe we like to print just one column. Now, if we, we can print the first column by this statement, where the colon means the entire vector from one till the last element, and comma one means the first column of B. So again, it's row, comma, column. If I use colon, it means all the elements. And this statement, I will see, you'll see, this statement is the same as this statement. Element 1 all the way to the end. And MATLAB knows that end is the last number of the vector. Okay? Now, obviously, I can also request, this was my original B, I can also request a row of B, for instance, the second row, and then I do this. And then what you see here, this is the second row of B. And now I use second row and colon means all the numbers. And again, this statement is equal to this statement, element one, all the way to end. End is the last element. In this case, that's 10. Okay? Now, the nice thing of MATLAB is that if I clear my screen, if I have B, I can just use 
functions directly on a matrix B and the function will immediately do element by element. For instance, imagine that I like to compute the sinus of B. Then I immediately get for each number of B, I get the value of the sine, okay? It's ideal, okay? So you don't have to do one by one, you can immediately with the function like this, sine, it immediately computes the sine of each element of B. I can also take the absolute values of B. Remember, these were my values, my original values, and now I have a state, I have a function called apps, which is absolute, and now each value becomes an absolute value, so positive. And if you don't trust the function, you just do help that function, and then you go up, and then it says here, absolute value, abs, x is the absolute value of the elements of x. Okay, again, this is a built-in function. It's already existing. Now, we've done this. Obviously, I can, I already look like we looked at uh, something like this, but we can assign this to another variable, for instance, c. Yeah, now the, my variable c is a vector of 1 by 3, yeah? And obviously I can also, if I like, transpose this thing, and now it becomes a column vector of 3 by 1. So these are just ways to work with matrices and vectors. Now, this statement, is this going to work? Will MATLAB allow me to do this? So basically what I'm saying, I like to remove this, this number. This is 3, 1, 2, 3, this is the third row. And then this is column 1, 2. So I'm talking about this number. Basically I'm saying I don't like that number, minus 7. I really hate that number. I want to remove it, get rid of it, okay? It reminds me of my whatever. So. Is MATLAB going to allow this? What's going to happen here? Yeah, so we cannot remove this, and why? Because if we remove this, then this will need to move up in that direction, which means there's an empty cell here, which means we have, we have three elements here, then we have three elements here, and then we have a row with two elements, and MATLAB doesn't know that. MATLAB cannot have the, the matrices, they need to, all, all the rows need to have the same number of elements. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So yeah, this is supposedly not, and you see, and sometimes these errors are strange. When you look at it, you're like, what does this mean? But over time, you actually start to understand what that means. Typically, something that appears in red, that means I'm not going to do it for you. Okay, but what I can do, obviously, if I have my B, I can remove an entire row with this statement, yeah? And now this is my new B, so I remove the entire third row. And this is my new B, B now. After the third row was removed, the fourth row now becomes the third row. I can also remove, of this B, I can also remove the second column, yeah? And if I define this, then this becomes my new B. So these are statements that you know how to work with matrices and factors. Now, what I have left here is something that has six values. And there's a function in MATLAB that can be very useful, and that's a function call, called reshape. So I go back to my original matrix here, I will clear everything, I will define B here again, I go down here, and there's a function here called reshape. Now reshape by itself already indicates more or less what this function does, is our original matrix B was 4 by 3, yeah? 4 rows, 3 columns, and maybe again I need it displayed in a different way. I know that I have 4 times 3 elements, which is 12. Now with reshape, 
I can reshape B in all kind of different ways where I say, you know, I want to reshape my matrix B and I like it to have two rows. Remember, it's always number rows, number columns. Now I have two rows, one, two, with six columns. So some reshaping takes place of my original matrix B. And I didn't save it into a new matrix, but I could save this in a new matrix. I could make this C if we like to. And now this matrix has the elements of B, but reshaped with two rows, six columns. The same I could do, I could make it uh, three by four. Yeah, originally B was four by three, and now I made it three by four. And you need to figure out how this reshaping works by looking in detail where what number ends up. Okay, I leave that up to you. Okay, but there is an algorithm behind that. Okay, and of course, we can always do help reshape and we'll get some information about this function here. So it changes the size. Now the nice thing of reshape is that we have our B, we have 12 elements, maybe we like to have a vector. So now we have a vector B originally had 12 elements, what, so what type of vector would this be? Is this a horizontal or a vertical vector? Yes, this is horizontal because I asked for one row with 12 columns. And now you see that you have all the elements of B as a vector. So this is the reshape function. Now, we have looked at this as well. If this is B, I could square each number of B by using this comment that this little hood thing, it's the, this hat thing is raised to the power. So, and the dot is needed because I do element by element, okay? And this is different than this, okay? You see, we cannot use this, this statement because MATLAB thinks we're going to do matrix algebra, okay? Which is completely different than what we like to do. This was our B. And simply what we like to do, we just like to raise each number to a certain power. And then what you do is you just use this statement. If I like to take the square root, I simply do this. And what you see here is the square root of a negative number becomes a complex number. There's a small part in chapter two about complex numbers. We're not going to cover this in class, okay? complex numbers, but MATLAB can calculate with complex numbers. By the way, this is the same as this function, the square root. Okay, so if this is my b again, yeah, I'll go back, this is b with this statement, square root b, or b raised to the power and half, that gives us the same answer. Again, square root is just a built-in function. So the square root of 16 is, yeah, so square root is a built-in function. Now, we have done vector calculations, yes? So imagine we have two vectors, u and w, on lane, uh, line uh, 85. And we like they're both of the same size, so we can subtract one from the other. Yeah, u minus w, that works. Add, we can also add them together, line 91, because again, they're the same size. We can also divide u by w, but we need to do element by element, because if we don't use this dot thing, and we will get to this later in chapter six or seven, MATLAB assumes we're gonna do matrix algebra or factor algebra, so please use for the first few chapters, use that dot if you work with factors and matrices. Then MATLAB knows it's element by element, so I need to divide U1 by W1, U2 by W2, U2, yeah. So yeah, I can have U and W, and now with this statement I can simply, I have this new vector where the first element is 4 divided by 2, the second element is 5 divided by 7, the third element is 6 divided by 9. And again, 
MATLAB only shows four significant digits, yeah, for convenience. But in its memory, it stores exactly what it is. Not four significant digits, but many, many more, okay? Okay. Now, the same thing applies to matrices, yeah? We had our B and we have C. And I showed this last time, now B and C are of the same size, so I can add them up together, I can subtract one from the other, I can divide one by the other, but again if I want to divide two matrices, I need to use that dot, dot slash, yeah? And then I'm going to get this, okay? Where this element is B 3,2 divided by C. 3,2. Okay, now we've talked about this is in a question on the quiz inner and outer products. And I'll just go over it again. An inner product gives you a single number. An inner product is a horizontal vector times a vertical vector. And again, they both need to be, they both need to have the same number of elements. So if the horizontal factor has 10 elements, then the vertical factor also needs to have 10 elements. Otherwise it's going to crash. That's an inner product. A factor outer product is a vertical factor times a horizontal factor and that results in a matrix. And we went over this last time for 15 minutes, so please, here I go over it again. And please study this, okay? And please also, I put comments everywhere in the text to make it easier for you to understand what's going on. So please study these scripts. If I cannot cover something in class, please study the scripts. It's important. Now, remember we have U and we have W. Uh, we have B, so now we have a vector and a matrix, and I, let's not go in too much details right now, but MATLAB can do matrix algebra, as I said, so what we can do is we can do U times B transposed, okay? So again, this is U and this is B, and now MATLAB can do all kind of nice matrix algebra things by using the multiplication sign. So no longer the dot, but just the pure multiplication or divide by, and then MATLAB goes into the mode of matrix algebra where horizontal times vertical, okay? So U is a horizontal vector of three elements, B, has four rows. So if I do this, this is not going to work because the number of rows here is not identical to the number of columns of U. But if I transpose B, then this is going to be transposed. So this is going to become three by four and then it's going to work. And I get an answer like this. And why this is, this is matrix algebra. And we'll get to that later. Okay. Now, Function here, we need to move on a little bit because I want to make sure that we covered all the material. A function that's very useful is the function lin space, okay, which means linear space. A built-in function which has two input variables at least where you specify the minimum value and the maximum value. So lin space creates a vector. Okay? So x is the output of my function here. I request a vector x here, that's the output, is equal to the name of my function, lin space. It's a built-in function. It comes with MATLAB when you purchase MATLAB. This is the lower value of x. This is the upper value of x, and this is the number of steps. So if I execute uh, this function, what I'm going to get is this. I'm going to get 
25 values that start at yeah, minus 10 and ends at 10. That's the function lin space. Okay? And why is lin space so useful? If I, by the way, if I don't specify a third element here, lin space assumes that you're going to want to have a hundred elements. So in this case, x has a hundred values. So if you don't specify a third input variable here, lin space will assume that you request 100 values. In this case, I request 10 values. So I'm going between minus 10 and 10, and I have 10 values. So this is a very useful function. Why? And I will show it to you. Imagine that I define a vector with some coefficients, and that's why it's called c. So my first coefficient called, uh, is called 0 0.2, my second one is minus 0 0.5, my third one is 0 0.1, and my fourth one is 2. Now what I have is I have a vector of x values, I have some coefficients, so now I can actually create a polynomial function where I have a function that has x to the power 3, I have x to the power 2, I have x, and I just have another thing that I added for fun, which is the sinus of x. Okay, so we know that x is a vector there, consisting of 25 numbers between minus 10 and 10. This is what we created, okay, so we will recreate it here. Yeah, this was my x value. These are my x values. Now I create some coefficients, and now here, look at this line where I say I compute y is my first coefficient, first row, first column, so that's 0 0.2, times x to the power 3. And again, why do I use the dot? Because I want to do element by element, okay? So each x value is raised to the power 3. And I add to this x to the power 2 times my second coefficient, which is minus 0 0.5. And then I add to this my third coefficient times x plus my fourth coefficient times the sinus of x. So this is wonderful. This is directly a vector calculation. x is a vector. And now immediately what comes out is a factor of corresponding y values. And this is the power of MATLAB. Now I have x and y. This is x and y. Okay. So if x is minus 10, then y is minus 249, etc. And if x is 10, it's 149. Now... And now MATLAB has a nice function that's called plot. And it will immediately plot x versus y. So this is a built-in function which is called plot. Makes a figure on your screen. On the x-axis I have the values of x. And on the y-axis I have the values of y. So I plot this versus this or this versus that. And what, what's here between these accents or whatever, how you call it here, that's in blue, blue pluses, okay? And that's what you see. You see symbols that are blue and a plus. And this is how it looks. And that's a built-in function. So plot has input arguments, the x factor, comma, the y factor, comma, the way you like this to be plotted. And I request here that I want this to be blue, blue symbol, and I want the symbol to be a plus. Some don't like that, some they actually, and now what you need to do is hold on. That's also a very important statement, it's explained here and why. Because if I would plot something again, and I, don't, I did not put hold on, my function, my previous function will be gone, erased. With the statement hold on, MATLAB knows, hold on to everything else that has been plotted in that plot previously. Okay, so if I now plot this same thing again, but as a red line, you'll see that now you also have a red line going through it. 
if I did not put hold on and just put this statement immediately after this statement, I would have only seen the red line. So hold on is a useful statement. Okay? Now, imagine you like to submit this to your professor and you know that, okay, my professor is one of those difficult professors and when he gets this plot, he's gonna request like, what's the X label, what's the Y label, what is this? Is this like, like uh, the number of people versus like uh, the number of alcoholic drinks or what is it, yeah? Something like that, even though going negative, it's unlikely. Maybe the number of people that died versus the alcohol percentage that was yeah, brewed in Poland. People get blind there. I don't know if you know those stories. They make their own vodka in Poland, yeah? And sometimes they have the wrong alcohol and they wake up in the morning after a really good evening and they, they think suddenly like, oh, when my wife is so beautiful suddenly, and they turn out that they can no longer see, which can have advantages, but anyway, it happens. So MATLAB has a built-in function, which is called X label, yeah? And that basically just adds an X, oh. So if I copy paste this X label, now what you see, you see here X value. And you might think, oh, this is really a small font size. You can specify the font size here, okay? I can quickly do that for you. If I do font size, I can make it 20, for instance. And now what you see, that it's much larger, okay? So you can specify a number of things. You can also make it bold. You can make it whatever you like. But these are just additional inputs then. For now, it's okay that you know how to use X label. Now the same thing we can do is with Y label. And then this becomes the Y value. And now we also have the Y value. Does this make sense? So these are just built in things in MATLAB that are very useful. I'm using these options all the time. I have some data set and I like to plot certain things. So you use this plot option. And once you want to publish something, when you're at that time, then you're going to use some nice values on the axis because otherwise the reviewer is going to be upset. Now then, maybe you want to have a title, so you add a title to your function here. Example function of x, y. Yeah, you see that there on top? And that's the function title. Now, I can also add a legend to this, if that's what I want to do. Here. Now we have a legend in our figure. Again, these are all built-in functions. So now I plot the legend has the original data and the function that went through it, okay? And there's a perfect match because the data was created with the function, yeah? We know that, yeah? Okay. Now. Some of you like math, some of you failed, but six of them, try to find them. So X is lint space, and I'm gonna plot the sine, the cosine, the tangents, and the cosine times the sine. So here we have line 203, we, have, we first create X between zero and two times pi, and we ask for 100 values, remember? If we only have two input variables for lint space, then we automatically lint space will return 100 values. And so that's default in lint space. So now what I can do, remember, this is one plot, but maybe we don't want one plot, we like all kind of plot next to each other, yeah, in one figure. So let's just remove this one. MATLAB has this nice option which is called subplot. Oh. Where now I have in this subplot, I plot the x value which was between 0 and 2 times pi and the sine of x in red. 
and I put hold on here so that if I plot the next subplot that this subplot will still stay there otherwise it's gone it's very annoying I know but that's what hold on will do for you okay and what do I say here I say here that I have a subplot, I have two rows, two columns, and this is the first sub, uh, subplot. So this is going to be a figure with four figures, because two times two is four. So I'm going to have two rows, and I'm going to have two columns. And then this is the first figure, and that's going to be the top left. Okay, now I can go to the second figure, when I'm going to plot the cosine where this is now two again two by two and this is now the second figure which is next to it this is the cosine and I plot this in blue then I can plot the, the third one yeah and then I can plot the product of the cosine and the sine and that looks like this okay so I go from one one two, three, four. I can have any number of subplots. I can have 65 subplots if I like, even though that's hard. So like 70, where if you want 70, you can make this 10 and seven. And then you move all the way from one through 70. But this is how you plot with different colors, okay? This is important. You will be asked a question on the quiz related to this, okay? Now, MATLAB, this is simple, this doesn't really look great, yeah? MATLAB also has all kind of nice 2D and 3D options. Let's see if this actually works. Here, you see, you can plot things like this. You see, you can plot three-dimensional surfaces in MATLAB. And we can show one example and this will come back, this is a question on the, on the, uh, in the quiz. So imagine that I like to plot a function c, that's a function of x and y. Okay, so I see line 217, I have c as function of x and y, if phi is 5 minus 2 times x squared minus y squared, that's my function. And I like to plot this. My math teacher told me, Jasper, please plot that function. And obviously I'm lazy, so I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to go online and someone tells me online, you should go to MATLAB. MATLAB can do that very efficiently. So the first thing that my teacher told me is, you need to plot that function with x values between minus 5 and 5 and y values between minus 3 and 3. So the first thing I do is I create x values between minus 5 and 5 and y values between minus 3 and 3. Oh. Yeah, so that's what we do. So now I have 25 values of x between minus 5 and 5, and I have 25 values of y between minus 3 and 3, because I request 25 outputs. Now I have my x and y values. So I have x values moving in this direction, and I have y values moving in this direction, and now I like to plot the three-dimensional surface. Now MATLAB has a fantastic function built in that based on those x and y values it can make a grid of those, those x and y values because x and y are only vectors yeah with values and I need to have a grid of x and y values so mesh grid will create now I have here a grid with x values yeah and with y values. The y values are going between minus 3 and 3 here at the bottom. Okay, so now I have xx, I have yy, and now very simply I can use this statement where I say my c value is my function is x is 2 minus xx squared minus yy squared and of course the dot is needed because it's element by element okay 
So now what I can do, now I have my C value, now I can make a nice plot. Let's see here. Like something like this, where this is my X value, this is my Y value, and that's my Z value. So this is what the teacher asked to do, yeah? And obviously, I like to add labels, otherwise I'm stuck. So with these labels, is X label, is X value, Y label, Y value, and then we have C label, that's the Z value. So now we have a plot here where we plotted that function C as function of X and Y and we made a nice surf plot. Okay. Now, and we can make all kind of plots like this and you can practice this at home but I can clear the plot here but you can make uh, these type of plots here these are different plots that you can make based on the same data it's called the mesh plot the surf plot we've already seen there that's a surf C plot and this is a surf L plot what really these differences are but here you also see the contour lines yeah so it's based on your preference but uh, you should be able to um, to know these functions a little bit at least, that they are existing, okay? Now, maybe we like a color bar because now we have no idea what this really means, yeah? We have an idea, but maybe a color bar would be nice. Now, we add the color bar to this whole thing and you see that's all messed up because I have a, uh, the MATLAB version that I used, and fortunately this is recorded is a version that was from a postdoc from uh, Belgium and that is like from 2006 or so with a general key that installs everything but unfortunately because it's a hacked version there are some side effects on now and then yeah so no big deal we just don't use color bars in our publications and now with the option view you can change the view you can change the shading and you can add contour lines. So imagine a complex numbers, we, uh, you know, we, uh, you can quickly look at, but we're not going to go in too much detail. Now the last part for today is strings. So far we've been talking about numbers, okay? And let's talk about strings now. And again, this might go a little fast now, okay? Because I need to prepare you guys quickly for next week, the quiz. I'll spend 30 seconds on that and it is we have three quizzes and three tests and a final project and the, the, the lab attendance. Why? To give students the opportunity to make up if they didn't understand things in the beginning. So you have seven or eight opportunities to do well because I can also give one exam at the end and if you mess up then you're in trouble. Yeah. So that's why we give as many opportunities as possible, which means that the first week it's typically really busy, okay? Afterwards we can slow down a little bit, but the first quiz is generally going to be easy. Please study the script. So I try to go over everything in class, but just at home go over the scripts. There's a lot of extra text, uh, text in between that explains what is happening, why it's happening, why it's done a certain way. If you understand the scripts, you're going to be fine. The statement on line 283 is, is not a true statement, okay? But line, uh, people might know who Johan Cruyff is. Johan Cruyff is a Dutch soccer player. Anyone know soccer here? No one knows soccer, okay? F wonderful audience. So, uh, yeah, Johan Cruyff like, uh, was like with Maradona, was like, uh, like the best soccer players in the world with Messi. So that's why I put him up there, because we're really happy that we have Johan Cruyff. He has a lot of uh, wisdom. Like, uh, like, yeah, anyway, I won't go there. It, it, it's too difficult. He has his own language of the way he, he talks, yeah? So he always says, like, every disadvantage has an advantage. Think about that one. It is true. 
every disadvantage has an advantage, okay? Like for instance, uh, one time the, the Netherlands were playing against uh, Italy or so, and a few of our players were injured. Yeah, of our top players, and then he was interviewed, and and then, you know, they were asking him, so yeah, that's a big deal. The players are injured, and so what's the coach uh, going to do? He said, no, actually, it's not a problem at all. You know, now you only have 15 players left, so it's only easier to make the decision which players to take. Yeah, so if you have three extra players, you have 18. So statistically, it's easier. The fewer players you have the easier it is to select which ones are going to play, yeah? Well, I thought that was very well thought through, yeah? He has his own university, by the way, Johan Cruyff University. But anyway, you guys don't seem to appreciate soccer, so let's continue. <laughs> um, uh, we have numbers, and now we're going to go to strings. So his first name is Johan, his last name is Cruyff, so I can just, uh, you know, in MATLAB, I can just add this, and now it's, uh, MATLAB knows that the first name is Johan, and then his last name is Cruyff, and we're going to ask for the last name, so you see Cruyff, and maybe I like to add them together, yeah, for the database, because now you can add them together in this way, so we have square brackets, first name, then we have a space with, with primes, and then we have the last name. And now we're going to have the combination of Johan and Cruyff. So this is how you can put strings together. Okay? Now, sentence is, I can also define a sentence here. If I use these primes that I use for transpose as well, yeah? So UCI is the best engineering school in the country. Now, certainly after I was hired, that is certainly not true anymore. <laughs> so it went down 30 places in the ranking. So, but imagine that this is true, hypothetically, yeah? Um, then, this is a string. This is not consistent, there, there's no numbers in here, yeah? So, I can request what are the first three elements of my sentence. And then I say, this is a row string. So I define row, comma, and then I ask for the first three elements. One, colon, three, which is one all the way up to three. And that's UCI. U is the first, C is the second, I is the third. I could also ask for all the way to 20. What a, then I'm going to get this. Okay, and once I have the first three, I can also transpose this, and now I have UCI, yeah, using transpose sign. So these are things you can do with um, strings. Now, there's this function called string to mat, where you can actually connect multiple different strings together in a field, and that's called string, the two is two, mat, okay? So now we have soccer is, and then we have all these different things. But I, I, I guess with this audience, it would have been better to do baseball or like American football or so, yeah? Anyway, soccer, you have a ball, you have a field, you have a referee, you have a call. So now and then you have some players. Now, what we also can do is imagine that you like to write something in an output file. And you have a number, and you like to somehow indicate what that number is. Instead of writing an output file with 7, 5, 3, you like to indicate what that number is. So in this case, you could define root 7, you could define with square brackets again and prime, the square root of 7 is, and then you use this function called num to string, number to string, where you, where you change a number, which is between the brackets, to a string, and that's what you're going to get now, that the square root of 7 is that number. That's what you're essentially going to get with this statement, okay? And maybe you don't like that it only has so many four significant digits, and so you can expect, you can request more if you specify another input argument there, okay? Now. I suggest that uh, the last thing I want to discuss, we have uh, we're a little over the time, but two more minutes, that's the function polyfall, okay? 
And again, it might be overwhelming, but please sit at home, go over these scripts. The quiz questions will be coming from my scripts. Just do it one by one. But I want to discuss this last thing, is remember that we looked at this polynomial function of x versus y. Now, MATLAB has a built-in function, which is called polyfall, where you define, and this is how that function is supposed to look, where y as function of x is a coefficient c1 times x to the power n plus a coefficient c2 times x to the power x n minus 1, etc. So what you can do here is we can specify what the, what the values are, c, these are the coefficient values, okay, and now, oh, So I have my C values here, yeah? And now what I do is I evaluate the polynomial function at the value x 1.5 because now I know my C consists of five elements, okay? So I have five different coefficient values, okay? So what I know is that the first one is minus 2 and that's x to the power n. But I don't know really what is n yet. What you see is that you have that last coefficient, cn plus 1. So cn plus 1 is minus 3. So with five coefficients, the highest order n is 4. Okay, it's minus 2 times x to the power 4 plus 5 times x to the power 3 plus 2 times x to the power 2 plus 0 times x minus 3. That's my function and that's included in line 314 in polyfall. So if I evaluate, if these are the coefficients that I define, that this is a question with five coefficient values, the highest order with polyfall is 4 because the last coefficient doesn't have an x value associated with it. It's just a constant. So imagine I like to plot a function, then what you can do is I define an x value here, I have my coefficient values defined, so now I can just plot x versus y, oh I define this as y, and now I have some function here, oh. This is, how my co this is how my function looks like with polyfall. So polyfall is a polynomial function. Okay, please go through the scripts two and three, study them in detail. Questions will be out there, will be coming from there about 12 to 15 multiple choice. And if you have questions, good luck. And those that did not pass Math 3D, cut an F, please talk to me.